I'm Cynthia Ng. You're tuning in to another episode of Awani Global. Now, joining me on the show today is the Brazilian Ambassador to Malaysia, His Excellency Ari Norton de Mura Quintea. Welcome to uh, Awani Global. Thank you so much for coming to our office. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. It's great to have you here. Now, we'll start with just talking about the history of Malaysia and Brazil. We have a long history of diplomatic relations going back to 1959. Uh, in fact, our embassies were established four decades ago. Now, despite being on the opposite end of the globe, I do wonder, uh, curious to know, what do you think that both nations share or commonalities that you think we have? Actually, I think that's a very good question because I think that uh, Brazil and Malaysia have a lot in common. If you look at the map, you um, are struck with your geographical distance between the two countries. But as a matter of fact, um, there are many similarities, uh, not only climate, mm -hmm. the climate uh, between the two countries is very similar, but also the warmth of the people, the friendliness of Brazilians and Malaysians. And I'm always very impressed with the friendliness of Malaysians, including to towards foreigners. Malaysians must be the most um, hospitable people I've ever met. But there are other similarities as well, which go beyond um, friendliness and climate. I believe that uh, the two countries um, have the same goals uh, in the international arena. Both are countries uh, in the South, the global South, mm -hmm. that uh, look towards um, not having to accept impositions from any other countries and who wants to have their, an independent voice yeah. in international arena. So that's a huge similarity between the two countries. Yeah, well, speaking about that, Brazil is obviously has been, is the largest Latin American country and has always been that middle power in that region, uh, which I will talk a bit more later on. But I do want to get into uh, what's happening in Brazil recently. Of course, you have just elected a new president, uh, President Lula, who served as president for two terms back in 2003 to 2010. Uh, I do wonder what impact do you think his return will have on ASEAN countries, specifically policies with Malaysia? A lot, because uh, we can predict what, government Lu what President Lula's government is going to be like, because he's already been president mm -hmm. for eight years in a row from 2003 to January 2011. Um, and his foreign policy is uh, traditionally a foreign policy that is very inclusive and which favors multilateralism and mm -hmm. pluralism. And I think he's very much aware of the growing importance of Asia, especially of ASEAN. Uh, in the international field. I believe that Asia and ASEAN in particular is the region of the world where things are happening, where you can see most clearly the rivalry between the United States and China. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very noticeable when you're as a non-Asian diplomat you're posted here in Kuala Lumpur. And uh, so what we can expect from uh, President Lula's government is a more proactive foreign policy and uh, a lot of attention paid to ASEAN. And I believe that is also the case uh, with the government of uh, Dato Siri Anwar Ibrahim. He's definitely, since he became prime minister in November, he's had a much more active foreign policy than previous Malaysian governments. And so that's something that he and Lula have in common. Uh, I'm curious to hear your thoughts about the role of Brazil and other countries in the global south, especially you mentioned about the heightened tension between the US and China. Of course, there's a war going on in Ukraine as well. How, how does this factor into his foreign policy, do you think? Traditionally, Brazil is a country that favors diplomacy and dialogue, mm -hmm. always. And um, in the last resolution in uh, the UN uh, in late February about uh, the war in Ukraine, one of the paragraphs in that resolution, and Brazil and Malaysia voted in favor of that resolution, one of the paragraphs was included at the suggestion of Brazil, and it's a resolution that asks for um, the end of hostilities. Um, Brazil uh, is, at this precise moment, President Lula has consistently declared 
that he is willing to cooperate with all countries mm -hmm. that want to put Ukraine and Russia together, um, sitting at the table, to dialogue. It's not easy, obviously. There are many issues at stake. But Brazil believes that dialogue is the beginning of any uh, peace process, of any real in uh, intention to promote peace and not war. Um, I would like to go back to a question you, the question you asked before about relations between Brazil and Malaysia. Uh, last year, Brazil became a um, sectoral dialogue partner of ASEAN. And that was a very important move mm -hmm. in our opinion. Um, and we are very happy that ASEAN accepted our proposal for us to become sectoral dialogue partner. That means that uh, Brazil from now on is going to be one of the a uh, few countries that will have a special relationship with ASEAN mm -hmm. as a whole and the ASEAN countries individually. And with, uh, we intend to, um, within that sectoral dialogue, to discuss forms of cooperation, technical cooperation, including technical cooperation between Brazil and the ASEAN countries. At this precise moment, Brazil is uh, discussing with ASEAN how, what areas of cooperation mm -hmm. could be possible. Malaysia is a country within ASEAN that has already proposed four areas for cooperation with Brazil in the area of agriculture, mm -hmm. uh, how to develop production in um, uh, corn, aquaculture, soy, and um, we are open to any other proposals. The cooperation Brazil provides is, uh, from our point of view, very interesting for the following reason because Brazil does not provide cooperation, monetary cooperation. What it does is provide technical cooperation, but at the request of the other country. Why is that important? Because it means that we don't impose cooperation mm -hmm. that maybe the other country does not want okay. to receive, but which responds to uh, individual needs of Brazil. We don't do that. We only react to request from cooperation from other countries. So the cooperation, the technical cooperation we provide is in response to a demand formulated by the other country. Okay, can you talk to us then about some of the um, conversations that you've had with Malaysian and policymakers? What kind of collaboration do you see will take place between these two nations? It, it, this is very interesting because in January I visited the Minister of Agriculture of Malaysia, mm -hmm. the new Minister of Agriculture, and, um, and we talked about all areas of um, about trade between Brazil and Malaysia and about um, possible cooperation in the agricultural field. And I mentioned that the Minister of Agriculture last year, before his term as Minister uh, began, uh, in the previous government, had proposed those four areas of cooperation mm -hmm. within the, the agricultural uh, sector. And in fact, we are already in discussion with uh, Malaysia about how to provide that uh, technical cooperation. Uh, in September last year, uh, an officer from our cooperation agency came to Malaysia to have meetings with the Ministry of Agriculture. And uh, when the Ministry of Agriculture uh, issued a press release about my visit to the minister, the thing that caught their attention the most and which they stressed in the press release was the cooperation in the production of corn, mm -hmm. how to develop uh, the production of corn in Malaysia. And uh, there's a reason for that, and the press release stressed that. It's because if Malaysia becomes more competent in the production of corn, in the uh, medium term, the, the price of chicken, for example, uh, goes it's down. Chicken feed. Yes. So, and, and, and that caught my attention because the Minister of Agriculture could see that mm -hmm. technical cooperation is not something in the open space that will just for the beauty of it. It has yeah. practical effects for the population of Malaysia. Um, and that is very important because Brazil is actually one of the main exporters of corn to Malaysia. But we are quite happy to uh, discuss uh, uh, how Malaysia can become a bigger producer of mm. corn. Now, if we dive a bit further into trade, if you look at numbers in 2020, <coughs> Brazil was Malaysia's uh, 27th largest trading partner with a total trade of 2.3 billion US dollars. Uh, that's a pretty impressive figure, but how do you think that we can further increase trade and investment opportunities between two countries? 
always between when you have trade between two countries the figures of from the official figures from one country do not match the figures of the other country yes. for several reasons um, what I can tell you is that in 2021 by la according to the Brazilian uh, data um, trade between Brazil and Malaysia was the highest ever it reached 6.4 billion dollars Brazil has a significant super avid, but it's an important trade. And what happened in 2021? Malaysia was that year Brazil's, uh, uh, one of Brazil's most important trade partners. Uh, in 2021, we exported more to Malaysia mm. than we did to many more traditional partners, such as uh, South American countries, our land neighbors, and many European countries, including... What was driving that increase? The economies between Malaysia and Brazil are convergent, mm -hmm. are compatible. We are not rivals in, uh, in what we produce and export. And um, even though Brazil has a huge superavit, it's important to know that Malaysia, on the other hand, um, has what Malaysia exports to Brazil is of much higher value because Brazil traditionally exports to Malaysia agricultural products, mm -hmm. but we import manufactured products, electronics, um, semiconductors, uh, rubber products. Um, so the economies of the two countries, even though we, we, if you look at the map, two countries mm -hmm. in the south with similar climate, so maybe their production is uh, incompatible and they can't export to each other, that's not the case at all. In Brazil, there's this myth that Malaysia is an agricultural uh, country, that Malaysia is an exporter of agricultural mm -hmm. products, and that's not at all the case. Malaysia is actually an important uh, country in the um, global chain of semiconductors and mm -hmm. electronics. So um, what Brazil sells is compatible to what Malaysia sells. That's the, the short answer to your question. <laughs>
Then a few weeks later, still in September last year, a very important trade delegation came, fr came from Brazil to Malaysia. So uh, what does that all mean? That if you improve communication between the two countries and people-to-people -people contacts, gradually um, investors and producers and exporters from both countries will get to be more interested mm -hmm. in investing and exporting in and to the other country. That is so fascinating to hear what you said about what Brazilians uh, know of Malaysia and clearly you know there's a lot more work t to be done. Uh, I don't want to go into something that is of interest, a global interest when we talk about Brazil. One thing that us Malaysians would think of is the Amazon rainforest. It's a, it's a topic of global concern because of its, it's the nature of the, uh, the forest itself and also the um, environmental aspect to it. So I'm, I am interested to know more about what the new president, President Lula, will do, especially in responding to criticisms about deforestation. Um, and also previously we have heard <coughs> Uh, issues like loosening environmental regulations pertaining to the Amazon rainforest. What is his stand uh, at this point in time regarding environmental protection? Again, we can be pretty sure of what his policy for the Amazon will be because he's been president already in the past for eight years. And during his term as president, his two consecutive terms as president in, from 2003 to 2011, eight years, uh, deforestation in the Amazon was reduced by 80 uh, percent. President Lula, from the very first, uh, he uh, became president on January 1st in this new term, and he's been very consistent in declaring and in acting towards uh, having a more effective policy towards the Amazon. Mm -hmm. And he has the aim of um, stopping illegal deforestation uh, until by 2030, um, he um, wants to have by 2050 a um, carbon neutrality uh, in Brazil, which is the same aim as the European Union mm -hmm. and the same date. So we can be pretty sure of what his policy is going to be. When he visited President Joe Biden at uh, the White House in February, he declared to President Joe Biden that wa that was going to be one of his top priorities. And if you see, saw the images at the time, you may have seen that President Joe Biden crossed his fingers. Mm -hmm. And uh, but there's no need to cross one's fingers. We Lula is a very predictable person as a, a leader, and uh, we know what he's going to do to protect the Amazon. He's going to implement again the action plan that he had as president and which was abandoned by the previous government, an action plan to protect the Amazon. And uh, so he's been already mm -hmm. in these uh, nearly three months since he became president again, he's already been quite active towards mm -hmm. protecting the That's Amazon. That's great to hear. Yes. I think on, on a Thank different you. note as well, I think uh, one of the success stories of President Lula when he was the president the first time was some of the social welfare programs that yes. he had implemented, uh, which was <coughs> the Bolsa Familia, which he also recently um, reactivated. I think it was so successful that this subsidy program was adopted by 20 different countries. Yes. Can you talk to us about this program? Now, why was it successful the first time and what does he aim to do this time around as the president the second time? Bolsa Family is a very uh, successful program, was ver a very successful program uh, from the start when President Lula launched it when he first became president for the following reason, because it's very innovative. It's not only a cash transfer program, it's a program that uh, has the aim of, um, it creates social policies. Mm -hmm. So for example, in order to be able to, uh, to be entitled to get the help provide, the cash transfer provided by the program, uh, your kids have to go to school. You have to prove that your, skill, that your kids go to school. Um, it involves, for example, prenatal care for the woman uh, in the family, in the, the, uh, the female member of uh, the couple. And by the way, it's a program that is, uh, the, it's a cash transfer that it's gi is given to the woman in the family, not the man. And that's very important uh, because it conveys the idea that it is family oriented. Mm -hmm. And so the aim of the program is not only a cash transfer, it has the aim of um, 
improving social conditions and uh, the life of those who receive uh, the, 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 the cash transfer. And uh, at the time it was very innovative and that why, that's why it was um, emulated by several other countries. And I remember that uh, for two years, between 2011 and 2013, I worked in a sector of um, the presidential uh, cabinet which uh, formulated, uh, helped formulate the policy for the Bolsa Familia. And the demand was huge. We often received visits from officials from other countries wanting to know more about mm -hmm. the program. Um, after, uh, in the last, uh, during the last government we had in Brazil, the program was abandoned. Uh, it was distorted first and then abandoned. So what President Lula is now doing is reimplanting the program and adapting it. What was the main consequence of the program when Lula was first president? Between 30 million people and 40 million people in Brazil were taken out of uh, poverty and placed into the middle class. Uh, not only because of that program, because of se several social programs, but uh, particularly thanks to that program. When you talk about a uh, range of between 30 million and 40 million people, you're talking about more than the population of Malaysia, and you're talking about the population of Spain. Mm -hmm. And so that huge amount that, uh, of uh, people were taken out of poverty into the middle class. What was the consequence of that? For the first time, you had around maybe 40 million people becoming consumers. Mm -hmm. So that helped the Brazilian economy. And by the way, Bolsa Familia has also an advantage because when it is given to uh, families below the poverty line in rural areas, for example, in isolated rural areas, small communities in rural areas, it helped the local economy because those families for the first time will be able to buy goods and groceries in, um, l with local merchants. So that helped the local economy of underprivileged uh, rural areas. So that's what Bolsa Familia did and that's what uh, President Lula intends to have it do again. Do you think he will do anything differently to the program? Well, it has to be to adapted. Mm -hmm. The value of the cash transfer has to be adapted, for example. Uh, uh, obviously, in, since um, he left the presidency the first time in January 2011, so we are talking about a 12-year um, distance between his last time as president and his mm -hmm. new term as president. So obviously, the value of the cash transfer has to change and social conditions have to change too. Mm -hmm. We're well, certainly to looking forward to see what President Lula will do in that respect. Now, in the final few minutes that we have, uh, Ambassador, I, I do want to get your thoughts about cultural diplomacy as it has always been a very useful tool to bring people together. Um, how would you use this to promote cultural exchange between Malaysia and Brazil? You know, there are more cultural similarities between Malaysia and Brazil too than one could imagine. Um, personally, I do my best. I write uh, a lot about Malaysia in the Brazilian press um, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm you know, when I first arrived, and uh, for example, uh, I was scared of trying Durian because I've, <laughs> I had heard um, people mentioning, even Southeastern Asians mentioning that they sometimes they fainted with the smell <laughs> of Durian. And, and the first time I tried Durian, I loved it. From the start, I loved it, and I've become addicted. And uh, I'm really fond of Durian. And um, so. Uh, there are cultural similarities. For example, if you take the cuisine of a very big state in Brazil, the size of France, called Bahia, in the northeastern part of Brazil, its cuisine has a lot to do with uh, Malay cuisine. It's mm. uh, spicy, it uses a lot of seafood, and uh, Malay cuisine reminds me a lot of the cuisine of Bahia. Um, and I think the cultural aspect is also very important because by knowing more about the culture of the other country, you also become more interested in the other country. So in the end, one thing that really makes Brazil and Malaysia be so close to each other, or so similar at least to each other, is the multiculturalism. Mm -hmm. That's a very important value. Brazil, like Malaysia, is a country formed uh, with the input of several ethnic groups. 
and several uh, religions and uh, so and I think that's very important that's one thing that makes it easier for Malaysians and Brazilians to understand each other and finally if uh, you were to speak to a Malaysian who has never been to Brazil what would you recommend to them what places to visit that's very hard. That's the hardest <laughs> question of them all. You, I will tell you why. Because Brazil, uh, India, is a huge country. It's the fifth largest country in the world and very diverse. Uh, so it depends on what you like. If you like going to beautiful beaches, but Malaysia herself has so many beautiful beaches. But if you like beautiful beaches, the beaches of the northeast mm -hmm. of Brazil. Uh, if you like um, historical cities, certainly the cities in a state in the center of Brazil called Minas Gerais, which is again as big as France, and that has many beautiful uh, cities well preserved from the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, if you like wildlife, obviously the Amazon region, but also a region which is less well known called the Pantanal in the center of Brazil, uh, which has a very rich uh, wildlife. And where are you from, Ambassador? Rio. From Rio. From Rio. All right. Well, thank you so much, Ambassador, for spending some time to talk to us about the relationship between Malaysia and Brazil. And best of luck to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for inviting me, and I was very glad I came. Thank you very much. Right, thank you.